Hello everybody. We have been discussing in last five lectures how the radiation encodes the information about the source and the medium through which it passes. Now let us say that this radiation finally reaches us and how will we detect that radiation. So today onwards we will spend a few lectures to understand the basics of radiation detection. So when I say radiation, obviously I mean electromagnetic radiation. And you know that the electromagnetic radiation spends over many different wavelengths and frequencies and we have given different names to it. So let me write about the electromagnetic wave spectrum here. Like we gave given their, them different names. So the names are like gamma rays, X-rays, UV, optical, infrared, microwave and radio. And you can uh, differentiate even further, you can say millimeter waves also, you can say far infrared, near infrared, near UV, far UV, soft X-ray, hard X-ray, etc, etc. Yeah, let's not go into so much of detail here. Roughly speaking, the frequency of these are roughly of this order. So this is in Hertz, this is 10 to the 19 Hertz. By the time you come to the X-ray and gamma ray boundary, this is like 10 to the 18. Here it is like 10 to the 16. Optical is more like 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15. And then 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10. And radio can go up to few tens of kilometers. Uh, so which corresponds to, uh, say, the detection that is possible sitting from the uh, from the earth is like 10 megahertz. Okay, so there is one more thing which is important to understand. In this is that our atmosphere is transparent only in these two regions. So these are the two windows which you can use to observe the sky sitting on the surface of the earth. And that's why you will see a lot of radio and optical telescopes are being built over the years. If you want to see anything else, you have to go to the space. So you make a telescope orbit the surface of the earth. Uh, orbit the orbit the earth and from there you get the data in terms of wavelengths and just to give you a uh, an idea and that the wavelength so I write like 1.0.1 angstrom here which is for the gamma rays you know for optical it is like thousands of angstroms actually more, actually like 5,000, 8,000 angstroms. Radio waves uh, can go up to few meters. So it's, uh, it's completely different ranges as you can see. So it's, it's a range of order 10 to the 10 or even more. Now it is quite easy to guess that uh, the detection techniques at these different regimes are expected to be different. There is a boundary over here which is about in terahertz, terahertz. In this side of the spectrum, we detect mostly photons. All the detectors mostly work, mostly all the detector works as photon detectors. So you see that photons are proportional the energy of the photon 
or number of photons are proportional to the intensity that we are talking about. If you talk about photon of a certain frequency, it is uh, proportional to the specific intensity. Here the detectors are more like electric field of the electromagnetic wave mostly. Sometimes we detect magnetic field also, but it's very hard. Okay. So this is E that is detected. And uh, there is very distinct difference between these two types of detectors, detections. That is what we need to understand first. What we will do is, we will consider these two types of detection. Let me give you a little bit beforehand. The detection here is called incoherent detection. We'll see why that is the goal of today's discussion. Detection here is called coherent detection. Okay. The example of the incoherent detection that we will deal with, we will discuss a little bit more in detail, is the optical case, which is the astronomy is being developed over the years in optical and only very recently infrared, ultraviolet, X-ray and gamma rays are being detected. X-ray and gamma ray detections are, again, it's a little bit different than the optical detection, but we will not be able to discuss all those in detail. We'll discuss the optical detection, which is there in your cameras also. So if it is cameras also nowadays, for the coherent detections, we will take us an uh, example of radio. Okay, so this is our plan. So first, to understand the detection, let us try to understand what is that we are trying to detect. We are obviously trying to detect the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, it's electro electromagnetic wave that is coming to us. So first let us talk about a monochromatic. And I'm keeping in bracket uh, linearly polarized. If it is not linearly polarized, then the discussion becomes enormously complicated. We don't want to go into that. Wave. So, a monochromatic wave. The electric field of such a wave, and once I say that it's linearly polarized, you see the wave is going, this wave is going in one direction. Say, let's, let's say it's going in x direction. So, you know that the electric field of this wave and uh, let's say okay also let's say plane wave so the electric field of this wave lies in this plane not because it's a plane wave it always lies in a plane perpendicular to the propagation direction but if it's a plane wave the electric field is same everywhere in this in this plane and it can have two components. We are talking about only one component here. Uh, so let's say this is the y direction. So we are talking about the y component. So I'm not writing E y explicitly because that's the only component we have because we have considered the wave to be linearly polarized. And you will immediately tell me what this will be as a function of x and t. This is sum E zero because it's linearly polarized. So it's not a function of uh, y and z and then e to the i kx minus omega t and i guess that you know very well what is uh, x and what is omega sorry what is k and what is omega so k is given by 2 pi by lambda and omega is related to the frequency it's the angular frequency now this is a plane wave and it's also a monochromatic wave 
So when I talk about a wave, I can analyze its property as it changes with x and also as it changes with t. So let us say that, let us say, let us assume that as an observer, I am fixed to a point. So that is uh, not very bad assumption because when you have a telescope, mostly it is at a given point. So at that point, what is happening with the electric field at different times is what you can observe at, at max. So that's what we are saying that we are talking about what is happening at a given point. So if, if, we, if it is so, so then I don't need to carry on this kx part for the time being because you, we see that uh, this, this is uh, at the particular x, so to the ik times x will just give me some number. So I say x equals to 0, I choose my coordinates as that, that x equals to 0, whatever the value of k is, I always get contribution 1 of 1 from e to the i k x. So I can deal with now the time dependent electric field as e so it only changes with time and this is e0 e to the now any electric field that you observe in reality there is nothing called a monochromatic light or monochromatic radiation because of that what will happen is that along with this will have components of the electric field from all different radiations, all different frequencies. And for different frequencies, if it is not monochromatic, then this electric field as a function of time will have contribution from many different frequencies. So this E0 can be different for different frequencies. And uh, what I will get is an integration over all omega. This contribution from all the frequencies adds up and that gives me how the electric field changes with time. Okay, so this is a non-monochromatic case which is the most general case which one can think of. Now this is a Fourier transform relation. So you re immediately recognize that this is a Fourier transform relation. So that means if I can measure E as a function of T, then what I can do is I can get E as a function of omega, which is having the information of which frequency has how much of amplitude, right? So this is the amplitude of a certain frequency oscillation. So this I can get just doing the inverse Fourier transform, if I have already measured ET. Uh, there will be factors, normalization factors here, which I am not writing because they are not very important for this particular discussion. You have to make sure that, uh, sorry, this should be DT now. You have to make sure that uh, you don't gain any signal 
by just doing the Fourier transform. So you put a factor over sort of there. So it's 1 by root 2 pi, which uh, in both cases will suffice. But anyway, I'm not very much sufficient about the factors right now. So I'm not considering writing them. But I get the C omega. And from your knowledge of specific intensity, from your knowledge of electrodynamics, you can easily see that the specific intensity I nu will be. So I can, I'm writing E nu, you know that E nu and E omega is just a factor of 2 pi different it's related to this quantity. So this gives me the spectrum. So this gives me spectra of the electromagnetic wave. Okay, so if I would have wanted to measure the spectra of an electromagnetic wave, what I can do now is I can measure the electric field as it is coming from the wave as a function of time. And I do the Fourier transform of it, take a mod square that gives me the spectra of the electromagnetic wave. And as we have seen that that spectra has a lot of information, that is what we have seen in the last lecture. So, it is telling you directly that how you can get the spectra of the electromagnetic wave this way. But this requires a lot more con considerations. So, let us do those now. Let's ask the question, what do I mean by the spectra of an electromagnetic wave? Okay. So, Let's take a con contrast of a monochromatic wave and mixed wave. Mixed means it is not monochromatic. Okay. So what is a monochromatic wave? A monochromatic wave of certain frequency, if I plot it with a function of time, we'll all agree that it will look like a sine wave, a sine curve, right? So this is what I'm plotting E as a function of T. There is only one frequency here. And remember that we are measuring this sitting at a given point in space. We call that x equals to x0. Now this has a very nice property. I know that E t, E as a function of t is E0 e to the i omega t, it's i omega t, uh, we're not writing the k part anymore, minus i omega t. And uh, it's monochromatic. And at most there can be a phase factor, right? So that also let us just skip. So it's phi zero. So we know omega if we can measure phi 0 and E0, we can write down, we can essentially predict E at any time T1. So I have an absolute predictive power with a monochromatic wave, which we, as we said, is a concept only. It doesn't exist in reality. But if such thing existed and somehow we have measured omega, phi naught and E naught, this three quantity describes the wave. So I know absolutely and everything about this wave. And once I know absolutely everything about this wave, I can predict it for any time. What will be the amplitude of this wave? At any time, I can tell you. 
So I have absolute predictive power in this case. In case of a mixed wave, which is not monochromatic, how will this look as a function of time? Well, it will not look anymore like a sine wave. It may look something like this. I'm just making it up. Say it looks something like this. Okay. If I look at this wave a little carefully, I see that I can follow the wave still something with this blue dash dashed curve. There is a lot of fluctuations around that curve. And this dashed curve is telling us that if I am here, I am above uh, this E equals to zero line, I have a positive amplitude. And that positive amplitude continues, I continue to have a positive amplitude up until I reach this distance in time, until I reach that time. After that, I continue to have negative amplitude. And obviously, if I have to plot, I plot this for longer time, things will change. Now, in this, there are many frequencies. So remember that this monochromatic wave, the E as a function of T, is written as E omega. So we need to differentiate this to E. So let me write DE prime here because otherwise you may think that they are the same function, right? E to the minus I omega T D omega. So this E prime omega can be many, 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 many values for each different frequencies and it's a mess. Can we have, but you see that this, this you can we still say that sometimes it is greater than zero for longer time and then longer time it is less than zero. So can we still predict something about this? Can you say that the mean value of the E will be still greater than zero uh, for say next five seconds if it is greater than zero now? To do that, you can see what we have to calculate is how much E is related at a given point in time here with another given point in time here. So there is a mathematical quantifier for this. It's called the autocorrelation function. So what is the autocorrelation function? It's defined this way. It's denoted with, with the Greek letter xi usually. And it's defined as a average. And we'll see what is that average of et with e t plus tau. OK. And you see, this thing doesn't depend on t, which means that uh, we have assumed, we have assumed ET has its statistics. This is a statistical information, ZIT, independent of time. So at what time do you calculate? It does not depend on that. It depends on the value of the electric field, the difference in the time in the value of the electric field, which you use to calculate. OK. So because E is a complex number here, usually this is taken as star. Okay, so we will try to understand this function, this autocorrelation function. Okay. It has different names. See, you, you are talking about the statistics at two different points in time. So sometimes it is also called two-point correlation function. 
the auto part of the autocorrelation comes from the fact that you are taking the same e as a function of t same signal and then you are correlating at two different points so that auto means within the same signal anyway so let's see what is the autocorrelation of the electric field is first of all what is this well this is easy to see this is e of t times e star of t so this is essentially this this looks like a standard deviation and it is a standard deviation square root of this is standard deviation this is the variance So this gives you the standard deviation of the electric field. You see, such an electric field is uh, has a lot of noisy kind of structure. So standard deviation makes sense. So that's a important information, statistical information of this electric field. For a monochromatic electric field, the standard deviation is directly related to E0. If you have studied electric electric circuits etc you know that the rms value is often quoted of an electric field that is essentially related to the standard deviation directly this is if i take a square root of this this is the root mean square value if it is not so so let's see how we do the averaging we do do the averaging because this is independent of time we do the averaging by observing it for a longer time so very long okay and in that time interval I integrate on that time interval I integrate this thing which is et into e star t plus tau and this i should put primes okay. it's an assumption that this quantity though i have t as the limit of this doesn't depend on tau uh, sorry doesn't depend on t it only depends on tau okay and if capital T is sufficiently long enough, it also doesn't depend on capital T. This function I can, uh, if I plot this function for a typical electric field, what do you expect this function to behave like? Well, for any electric field, even if it is a monochromatic electric field, you see, for a monochromatic electric field, this function will pick up at t equals to 0 the RMS value of the field. If it is not a monochromatic electric field, also t equals to 0, it will pick up the RMS value of a more fluctuating field. If I wait for longer enough time, then obviously here in this particular case of the mixed field, non-monochromatic field, if I wait for a time difference which is, so if I take tau to be this big, then you see one part is always positive, one part is negative, it will cancel out. So I, I get some value and then as I keep on integrating, that integration will cancel out. So, for very sufficiently long value, it will be 0, the value of this will be 0, and for sufficiently small value, it will have a certain value always, even for the monochromatic field. So, this will look something like that. I am just making up, the shape of this function can be different, but it will look something like that. So, what it gives is the time up to which you will be able to predict what this field 
predict something about this field. So for example, if this time in this case, I can define the time where it goes to half of its value. So this time is usually has a name. It's called the correlation time. Or this is we are talking about correlation in time. So this is temporal correlation time. Or temporal coherence time. Sorry. The autocorrelation function essentially measures the coherence in the field and this is called the temporal coherence time. Okay. So if we have more coherence, this temporal coherence time will be larger. So I request you to calculate the temporal coherence time of a monochromatic signal which has a frequency omega. So that is you can calculate because you have to just put in the electric fields here and then integrate and try to figure out so that's your homework what is the temporal coherence time of a monochromatic field of frequency omega so this is your homework Okay, so that is first homework. The second homework will be so here we def we showed we said that i nu is proportional to e prime nu mod square. So let's give this a name p nu. So this is often called the power spectrum. Okay. So the next question is. How is P nu related to Xi tau? This also is your homework. Try to figure it out. I will give you the answer, but you have to work it out. So the give the answer is that they are related by a Fourier transform. Okay, so xi tau has the same information as that of the spectra of the wave. You know that the Fourier conjugates, if I consider a function as a function of time, say, and say it has it's a Gaussian, just for the shake of understanding. So this is some ft. And it has a width, which I say, say sigma t. I do a Fourier transform of this function. And I get, for a Gaussian, I get back a Gaussian, plot it against omega. So let's say this function is f omega. And this has a width of sigma omega. And this also, this this what we are discussing right now, also is something that you have encountered in quantum mechanics a lot of time. This is how, and the uncertainty principle is a result of this mathematical structure that their width are in inversely related. So to say that for p nu and sigma nu, p nu remember is the spec gives you the spectra. So if it is a spectra of a single spectral line, which is very monochromatic, then the width of that line is very small, which essentially means that the width of xi tau will be large. So it will have a very large temporal coherence time. So monochromatic light Th 
this implies sigma omega much much small lesser than small <coughs> then sigma t is much much greater than 1 implies large coherence time the width of xi tau which is the fourier transform of p nu is essentially tc which is the temporal coherence time right so this is a any this is very very important information so the question now is that for what type of radio waves uh, sorry what type of electromagnetic waves we should be able to detect the coherence of the wave by measuring it and will not be detect, able to detect the coherence of the wave. So for what type we will be able to and what type we will not be able to. What will that depend on? Let's see. See, to know about the coherence information which is here, I need to measure the electric field as a function of time because otherwise I will not be able to do this integral. It's clear, right? So the coherence information is there in this xi t and that is coming out of this integral. So to know the coherence information, I need to measure the electric field as a function of time. So this is a very important understanding. So let us write that down, that to know the coherence information, I need to measure the electric field as a function of time. To know So if we can measure, so coherent detection means such measurement is possible. incoherent not possible So let's see what do I mean when I say that I want to measure such an electric field. Okay. So then we will be able to understand when it is possible, when it is not possible. So let me draw the wiggly electric field once again. So this is the electric field. And it's a continuous thing which say looks like this. Okay, just making it up again. So it looks like this. Do you see, I have a detector which has to detect. And one detector of light we all have, or many of them, them are our eyes. And the eye inside, we have this rod and cone cells which detects the radiation. So every detector. have 
two part, two very important properties. One is called, one is the integration time. I will tell you what do I mean by that. The other is called the date time. So what is the integration time? Well, when I say that I will measure at this particular time, I will try to measure the electric field. I actually do not measure or any detector, our eye and anything else do not measure exactly at that time, but it actually integrates all the radiation coming within that time interval. So it's so if the integration time I called uh, so what should I call it? Say delta t. Then it measure from t minus delta t by two to t plus delta t by two. And all that measurements is assigned to that value to that time. Okay. So it integrates over this entire region range average the electric field and then conclude that the electric field at that particular time is that average electric field okay this is the property of any detector there is no way you can detect exactly at a given time all that we detect at exactly at a given time is always zero that we have talked about earlier also once it has detected it has to read the data like in our it goes to our head it goes to some memory in the case of a computer system. Our computer system is our brain, so it goes to our brain. So once it goes to the brain, then the memory where this information of how much is detected, electric field is empty, so you can do another measurement. So by the time of the, it's free for the next measurement, so that time interval is called date time, often called as TD. So maybe it will be able to measure from this place. So the date time is this much. Okay. So again, it assigns the next set of electric field integrated over these four. So first was integrated over this shaded region. The second is integrated over this shaded region. And that is assigned to that point. So I get T1 electric field measured at say T1, then electric field measured at say T2, etc. So the effect of these two essentially is that the measurements are always discrete. And if you calculate over a time interval, you can calculate this time interval. This time interval is in this case T2 minus T1. So if I call this small delta T, this is delta T. So delta T will be, uh, let me use another color. So delta T will be this much here and this much here plus the date time. Right, so this, this much is delta T by 2. This time interval is delta T by 2. This time interval is delta T by 2. So I have to add these two, I will get capital delta T. And then I have to add the date time to get the difference between T1 and T2. So this is delta T plus T. So all measurements are happening at this time interval. So we call it sampling. So this process of measurement at this discrete time is called sampling. So what all is happening is I have this signal. I am sampling it at this certain time interval. 
okay so this is i'm trying to keep it fixed as much as i can so i'm calculating or me measuring the value of the signal at this time interval so let's see what i measure so what i measure i'm putting with this color so i measure say this number this number so these are representative number actually it is integrated around that point as we have already seen so this number this number this number it never goes back like this that's bad of my drawing okay so our measured thing how will it look like our measured thing will look like and now again it will not match with what i had drawn before but our measured thing will look like something this okay for an underlying field which may say look something like that so that blue curve information we don't have the information i have is the information of the white dots after the measurement now how fast should i need to do this measurement it depends on the integration time and the date time but the integration time in most of the cases you can actually change uh, integration time i can decrease and decrease sometimes if the signal is very weak i'll not be able to measure anything but you can still try the date time is can never be overcome it's a limitation of the detector so there is some minimum uh, delta t plus tt which is available to us given a detector that we are using okay but is it sufficient for us to be able to get the coherent info coherence information so let's ask that question now to get a coherence information what we are trying to chase are different frequencies in that mixed electromagnetic wave so essentially what this is trying to do is trying to measure the presence of different frequencies so i have different frequency with these different amplitudes and I'm trying to measure those different amplitude, dif different frequencies, different oscillations with different amplitudes. So let's say that uh, let's say that we are trying, we, we are poised to measure a particular frequency oscillation, and I have a certain uh, integ certain discretization time interval over which I will be able to measure. So will I be able to measure? that frequency oscillation if i can measure that frequency oscillation i will also get the coherence information of that and for that i just because we are now dealing with one frequency back again so i just draw a sine curve and say my uh, so i measure at t equals to zero ones and my next measurement happens at uh, say here okay and the next measurement happens somewhere here so again if you remember so let me change the colors because that will strike out uh, that will give you the real feel of what is happening next measurement here right so that obviously goes past this point and past this point So you see what is happening obviously is that I am guessing then of these measurements only these blue points I have. So the curve that I will get if I join them is not at all an oscillation. Okay, so if I wait for long enough it may appear as an oscillation but it's not as at least tracing the frequency that we see here, right? And that is the point that if i have delta t so large i will not be able to trace this oscillation of this frequency now what i try to do is i make a measurement just in between these two so somewhere here one measurement here so i reduce the reduce the uh, time interval over which i do measurements by a factor of two okay so i get points 
maybe my drawing is not very perfect but i get a point another point there so now i am measuring at half the interval and now you see what happens so if i try to add them now i see that i will get this type of curve and this though it doesn't look like the original curve does has the information does have the information about the oscillation that i'm trying to trace right so i need to if i do the sampling at this interval time interval so this is my sampling time now delta ts this works the previous sampling time delta ts prime say didn't work so that could not trace the coherence information this can trace the coherent information now there is a theorem i will not be able to prove the theorem so it's called nyquist shannon sampling theorem What it says is that your delta T s has to be smaller than half of the frequency or inverse of the frequency that you are trying to trace. You can write it in terms of omega also. Nu is 2 pi by 2 pi omega. Uh, sorry, omega is 2 pi nu. So we can convert it in terms of omega also. But this is the point. This is the Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem tells you that actually there is a less than equals to here. So it has to be at least twice faster than the time period. So 1 by nu is the time period of this signal because I put in 1 inside the time period, 1 extra inside the time period. For this case, it worked. So that's what is Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem telling you that your sampling has to be faster than half of the time period of the signal okay so now we have an idea of this is what i need to actually measure the coherence information and i know which part of the frequency band in the electromagnetic spectrum i want to measure so i can figure out whether i can measure the coherence information or not because delta T is, remember, given a detector, delta T S can always be greater than T D plus delta T. Right, so delta T I can change to some extent. I can at best make it zero, obviously, then you will not measure anything, but uh, can make it very small, as small as I want, not zero. And assume that the signal is very uh, amplitude of the signal is large enough that you detect something, but you can never beat TD for a given detector. And this entire thing has to be smaller than delta T s if I want to measure the signal and then delta T s has to be smaller than 1 by 2 1 by 1 by 2 1 by nu. So let's look at so let's take two cases say optical optical frequencies. Now when I say that I will detect, so the detector detects, but after that you need to take the data. Nowadays you will use a computer. The computer will have a certain clock speed and uh, obviously this cannot be more than, this cannot be faster than or this cannot be smaller than the clock, clock speed of the computer. Whether the computer can do any work at, at best at its clock speed, right? So optical frequencies nu is of the order of 10 to the 14 hertz, right? So you need delta T s to be 
of the order of 10 to the minus 14, say, second. So every 10 to the minus 14 second, your entire detector plus computer should work. Fastest computer, what is the clock speed of the fastest computer? It's say 10 gigahertz. So 10 gigahertz is 10 to the 10 hertz. So it can have a time interval at which you can sample the signal which is 10 to the minus 10 second you need 10 to the 4 times faster so optical detection is not possible in the coherent manner coherent at least today actually it even don't, does not hit here it hits at the dead time of the detector but that's a different story the dead time of the detector is much larger than 10 to the minus 10 second let's say radio frequency is what happens Nu is say 10 to the 9 hertz, delta T is, is 10 to the minus 9 second, fastest CPU is 10 gigahertz, this is quite possible, this is not possible. Okay, so you see that the detection technique now has to be completely different at two different frequency ranges. There is one more distinct difference between optical and radio is that because in optical frequencies if I ask you how many photons are coming in optical frequencies the number will be comparatively less because if I give you the same amount of energy each energy carries in this case 10 to the 5 times more uh, sorry each photon carries 10 to the 5 times more energy because the frequency is 10 to the 5 times larger. So in optical, for the same amount of flux of radiation, you will get 10 to the 5 times less number of photons. So the wave approximation of the radio uh, doesn't work at the interface of the detection. In radio, it works very well because the number of photons is also large as the frequency of each photon is lesser. So the, the wave approximation also works very well. So today we have learned about two different detection techniques and why one is used over the other at different optical and radio frequency ranges. And as I said that there is an, uh, not a very steady but uh, kind of uh, boundary, the frequency above which are detected for the frequency above which Incoherent detection is used where photons are detected and the frequency lower that electric field can be detected coherently 